Hi, I'm Laura McCullough, Associate Professor of English here at Brookdale Community College, and this is Brookdale's Visiting Writer Series. I'm talking to Sri Lankan and American writer Rue Freeman. Rue Freeman is the author of a couple of books and a forthcoming anthology. Her books are A Disobedient Girl and On Sal Mal Lane, her most recent book. She's also the editor of Extraordinary Rendition, an anthology that we'll talk a little bit about during our conversation today. Rue, I first got to meet you maybe almost 10 years ago, before you had any books at all, at Breadloaf uh, Writers Conference, an annual and one of the most important writing conferences in the country. So I, I remember way back when, when you were still you know, having these as a seed. What's it like now? You've got a couple of books. You're really traveling all over the world. Um, I think the interesting thing about writing is that as soon as you finish writing one thing, you are back to square one, starting all over again. So you get excited about what's happened, but then you have to start again and do something new and get people interested in some new thing that you've produced. And you have to get yourself interested in that too. So I think in some ways that person that you met back then, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. has never really gone away because mm -hmm. that kind of excitement is still there about mm -hmm. every little thing that I do now. Wow. Well, very much like Michael Andate, uh, who is a Canadian uh, writer now, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, his or origin, Sri original Lanka. country was Sri Lanka as well. Um, you, that country of origin is a big part of your novels. A Disobedient Girl, I've read that you considered it a love letter to your country. Yes. Um, uh, so the book deals with, uh, it, it alternates between um, two main protagonists. One is a little girl who goes to work in a house mm -hmm. with, uh, uh, as a companion, she thinks, to another girl who's five years old. And then her story is told over three decades um, as she discovers that she actually has to work for this family. And the other is the story of a mother who's leaving her uh, an abusive relationship and taking her three children with her, trying to find sanctuary. And her journey takes, uh, her whole story is told over the course of about 48 hours on a train. So um, since that journey takes place on a train, uh, you literally travel through the country as, as, your, as her story unfolds. Uh, so living so far away, I did have to go back and really, you know, uh, travel through the country mm -hmm. and remember little things that I had forgotten um, or just reimagine places that didn't exist anymore uh, because the story set several years before. Mm -hmm. So so in that way, it really was, uh, you know, a hearkening back to a country that I had left to come and live here. Well, one of the things that I loved about that book, and I hope everybody who is watching this is going to go out and get it, although the new one is fabulous too, but I loved a that it really in some ways explored class issues, mm -hmm. but it also explored issues of childhood and the perspective of, of being a girl. And one of the things that, that I saw that you wrote on online about the book, um, quote, I named and modeled the girl in the story after the servant who kept me company as a child when I visited my grandmother's house. So, so much of this is obviously a novel, but drawn from your memories and also maybe a burgeoning political activism that we'll talk a little bit about too, I hope. Yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit earlier before we got started mm -hmm. about the fact that I had grown up with all these boys in the family, all my brothers, all my cousins, and my mother taught at a boys' school. So I didn't really have a, a model of womanhood, I think, in the house so much as because my mother was deeply committed to her students and to the boys. And um, I mean, she was a sort of beloved teacher and very involved in school. So. Um, I always paid attention to people who came to work in houses and who were almost always women. And I, I liked observing how they negotiated that space because oftentimes to me they seemed like grown women, but they weren't always allowed to be women, you know, in the way that we uh, think of them as fully realized sexual beings and, you know, feminine in that way. They were people who worked. And um, so I, I always wondered what the, la what the inside of a mind might be uh, of someone like that. And the girl, that, the, that young little girl is named after Latha, actually, she, she didn't work for uh, my grandmother. She came with her mother who worked for my grandmother. So she was my age, she looked like me, and we played all the time, but she was not going to be a servant. 
Um, so, but at the same time, our lives are very different. And it's interesting you bring her up because just about two or three weeks ago, she contacted me on Facebook. Uh, because she'd, she had visited my aunt and she had told her, you know, she's written this book and it's uh, kind of revolves around your, someone of your character. And mm -hmm. um, so it was really lovely to talk to her about um, that time. Had she read it? She hasn't read it yet. And she wouldn't let me send her a book. She wanted to buy it with her own money. <laughs> you know, in, I hadn't kept in touch with Lata since we parted ways when I was about 15 years old. Um, but that's the same character of that girl, that girl who just wants to buy what she wants with her own money and, you know, that pride that she has. So it was interesting. There must be a strange sense of coming full circle. Yeah. And that yeah. was out of the blue? It was out of the blue. I mean, she, um, she was on Facebook and she was looking at my brother's feed. And it was interesting the things she remembered about me and my family and my brothers because we all went to my grandmother's house all the time. And um, she remembered me writing as a child. She didn't know what on earth I was writing and she remembered the letters I'd give her to mail because she would leave the house but I really was kind of in the house. I didn't get to go to the post office and things like that and um, and she said this must be what you were doing all that time, you know, writing stories and um, all of that. So it was, it was really a, a, a wonderful way to connect with her again. Wow. Well, I, I know that um, Sri Lanka is very important to you and in the aftermath of the tsunami you really became an advocate for Sri Lanka. And, you know, it is a somewhat small world, but it, it's also a world where many people have not been everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, Sri Lanka is about the size of... West Virginia. West Virginia. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that, put it in perspective for audience members who maybe don't know much about the country? So, so it's about the size of West Virginia, and it's an island off the coast of India, but it's a separate country. So, uh, y you know, in the same way uh, Americans living in the border towns don't want to be considered Mexican or Canadian, uh, we do not like to be confused with Indians, particularly because India is such a gigantic country. And We feel that way in New Jersey about New York. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so you understand. And uh, so it's a very small island. It's a tropical island right on the equator there. Um, lots of waterfalls, but also desert area and reefs. It's a very beautiful place. Um, and it's uh, a, a great, lots of parts of the country are, belong to the World Heritage, you know, they're mm -hmm. marked as World Heritage sites because of, um, it's, it's history is about 2,500 years old. And so there's a, there's a long, it's, a, it's an old country with lots of uh, traditions, cultural mm -hmm. traditions and language and, um, um, yeah. Um, well, you know, it actually leads, I think, into talking about your, your most recent book on Salmal Lane, which also has some uh, issues of class that, that reverberate through it, but it also deals with conflicts, mm -hmm. and your uh, Sri Lanka has a, a, a very um, violent history. There's been a lot of political strife there between ethnic and religious groups, and that became part of the book. And I'm wondering if you might speak to that a little bit. Um, uh, I think the interesting thing about it is that uh, when you live in Sri Lanka, you don't think of yourself as a violent, as having a violent history. Because uh, in the same way, I guess people um, in Ferguson or LA don't really think of themselves as having a, mm -hmm. a violent history. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. a moment in time, something happens because of a, a, you know, a snowballing effect of policies or practices or on the part of the police or whatever, um, and then something erupts. And so it, in many ways, even though the book is set in Sri Lanka, you could change the names and the street mm -hmm. names, and you could be anywhere in the world. Well, that's one of the fabulous things about the book, I think, because you're absolutely right. Anywhere in the world, and unfortunately, we have uh, violent history mm -hmm. everywhere. And, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, I think, in the second half of the show. But your ability to lay the domestic against this backdrop, I think is one of the breathtakingly beautiful aspects of this book. And how, how were you able to manage those elements? Uh, well, I mean, I came to the United States to go to college. So my whole life, um, formative, all my form formative years had been lived in Sri Lanka. So I, and I had lived through this period of time uh, down a lane that didn't look that different from this lane that I'm writing about. And um, looking at, from the outside, at how Sri Lanka was being covered, I really wanted to talk more about what the country was like and what it actually felt to see these changes come about. 
um, than write just about a war because anybody's country is not the his just the history of a war or a conflict. It's about people and how they interact and how things change when um, different policies are made um, and how that impacts often the most innocent people who really would rather not participate or just don't have any many opinions. Real about people these who don't necessarily have the ability to affect the larger things right. that are happening. Right. Um, although, I mean, we all do affect the larger things by the little things that we do. And so down this lane, for instance, do you go and visit a certain house or do you not visit a certain house? If you're in a school in the United States, do you speak to certain kids or do you not speak to certain kids? Mm -hmm. And all of those little things create the culture in which we live. And so that was kind of the driving force because I do a lot of other political writing about wars that we are perpetrating right now in other countries. And mm -hmm. I wanted to look at all of those things, but I found this vehicle to talk about that um, and place it in Sri Lanka because of course I know that the best. So in a way, um, your, your fiction and your a uh, burgeoning uh, 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 reputation as an activist and a journalist are having parallel lives. Yeah, but they balance each other out because mm -hmm. I think when I do the political writing, I'm not very, uh, uh, it's not very nuanced. I mean, because mm -hmm. journalism, I think, I mean, if you pick up a newspaper, you kind of know what you're getting, right? If you read the New York Times, you know what you're getting. If you read in the Washington Post, you know what you're getting. And um, and that's because all the nuance is being taken out. I mean, I'm sure the New York Times would hate me for saying that, but it's true. <laughs> well, I definitely think this is something we can follow up in, in the second, second half. half. That's okay. a great, great, all great right. point. I'm Laura McCullough, Associate Professor of English here at Brookdale, and I'm talking with the novelist, journalist, and activist, Rue Freeman. Please come back for the second half. With both my sons entering college, I knew financial aid was going to help. I never thought I would qualify, too. I enrolled in Brookdale's culinary program and discovered a world of talent I never knew I had. After graduation, I landed an externship with David Burke's Fromagerie, and they hired me a month later. My name is Debbie Doran, and I came to Brookdale to learn a new skill. I never imagined it would take me this far. When I was divorced, I needed to rediscover who I was. I had no career or college degree. My divorce attorney was so supportive. Working with her helped me realize I have what it takes for a career in law. I joined the paralegal program at Brookdale, and I got a great base to build a career on. Now I'm working as a paralegal at Ansel Grimm and & Aaron, and I love it. I'm Michelle McCarran, and I went to Brookdale for a new start. I never imagined I would find my calling. Hi, welcome back. I'm Laura McCullough, Associate Professor here in English, and this is Brookdale's Visiting Writers Series. I'm talking with Rue Freeman, novelist, journalist, and activist. And when we left on the break, we were beginning to talk about the relationship between her journalism, her nonfiction writing, and her creative work. And so, Rue, you have these two really wonderful books that in, in many ways uh, jump off of your experience as a multinational person, as someone who may be looking at the world from a, a more global perspective. And you have, I think you come from a family of people who uh, were very aware of political activism. And so pol political activism and your talent as a writer is something you're bringing to bear um, very much now in terms of some really important uh, global issues and, and issues that have to do with American politics as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you've come to be an activist? Um, well, you know, I grew up in a house with, uh, with parents. We, 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 we were not wealthy, but my parents were, my mother taught literature, and my father worked in government. And um, so we didn't, uh, and they were very politically involved, my father in particular, uh, very left-wing politics. And um, 
but my, but my mother taught literature. So I had these two things going in my life from the time I was very little. We also didn't have a TV or a radio, so all we could do was write. And books were expensive, so we got books from the Asia Foundation from America and from the People's Publishing House from the Soviet Union, which were very cheap, so you could buy those. They were, they were translations of uh, um, Russian literature into English, and you could buy them for a few rupees. But the big, uh, you know, other fiction from the West was very expensive, so you couldn't buy that. So those came donated from, uh, from the United States. So, so it was this, this funny mix of um, sources of inspiration and a way of... Uh, existing and entertaining ourselves. So everybody in the family wrote. Uh, my father is also a poet, so is my brother. He's an editor of one of the national newspapers there. The other brother writes. My mother wrote screenplays and did theater. So uh, writing was never something that I felt like uh, I had to go out and learn how to do because it was something we did all the time. So I always liken it to, you know, if you grow up on a farm, you don't have to go and get a, a, an education in how to milk a cow. You know, you just know how to do it. And so that's how we were. We just, we just did it all the time. And it was, um, it was a way of dealing with a lot of struggle that we were undergoing, uh, both as a family, but uh, because, of because of our politics mm -hmm. um, and in the country as a whole, because Sri Lanka, like you said, has had a lot of conflict. Um, and there was a huge right, uh, left-wing up, uh, uprising that was brutally put down. Um, my brother was in jail. Uh, my father got death threats all the time. So, you know, nearly 60,000 young people dis were disappeared and murdered. So um, it was very hard not to be engaged. And as a very young child, um, in Sri Lanka, you learn about world history uh, in a way that is very broad. I mean, we really get into way past our little island. Um, so there is a sense of your place in the world and uh, how the world impacts you as well as how you can impact the world. So I think that's where all of that comes from. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a way of doing things. Well, now, um, you've certainly um, been in some ways an activist for your, co for your country of mm -hmm. origin, but you're very, very active in the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and you have an anthology that's coming out in just a few months. Could mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the, uh, it's called Extraordinary Rendition, and it's coming out from more books. And uh, it's been oh, several years in the making. And I think it's, uh, when I first started wanting to do this, it's, uh, it came to me because my father, I was upset about uh, an attack on Palestine and, uh, in 2008. And um, my father said, you know, a long time ago there was this uh, book that was put out by your publisher, Simon & Schuster at the time, called uh, Writers for and Against the Vietnam War. And I had never heard of it. And, I, and he said, why can't you do something like that? Mm -hmm. and, and I think because you come from this small country, you just think you can do anything. You don't really think, oh, you know, there's an establishment that is not for me. And so I said, OK. Uh, and I tried to get people to join in to do this. And I only found one other person, a Jewish friend of mine, who mm -hmm. was a, uh, Matt, Matt Siegel. Whom Matt you Siegel, know, yeah. Um, who wanted to. Whose first book of poetry is about to come out, Matt Siegel. Yeah, and he was going to, the two of us got together and we said, oh, we can do this. And nobody wanted to join us. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, maybe if I find a publisher, someone will want to join us. And even then, no, I couldn't find a publisher. Uh, but I didn't let it go. So in 2014, when the you know the, during the July attacks on Gaza, there was a shift, I think, in American um, sensibility about what was going on there, and um, people were speaking out more. And I found a publisher, and then uh, the writers uh, began to come forward. And uh, the more writers came forward, the more other people came, and it was a beautiful exercise in how. You know, we think we don't really matter because, you know, like you were saying earlier, you're just one person and we can't really change anything. But you don't realize that speaking out about something gives somebody else courage to also step forward who may not otherwise. Well, so what kind of um, kind of material will be in the um, anthology? Uh, is it overtly political? Is it multi-perspective? And what are you really hoping will happen? What kind of dialogue are you hoping the anthology might spark? Um, the anthology has poetry, um, nonfiction essays, and uh, fiction. And um, most of the poetry is introduced by the poet uh, telling me why they selected that particular poem. And a lot of it is not necessarily about, it's, it is not a for and against 
uh, book either because I didn't really think that would be useful. I wanted more uh, to provide a space for American writers to speak because a lot of them have been very hesitant about speaking at all because they felt that their careers might be affected or they might offend people. Um, so it was a way of nudging that those people forward and, uh, and thereby again encouraging others to do the same. Um, but also an exploration of why we are not engaged. I mean, I think that the uh, America's foreign policy uh, with regard to Israel is at the forefront and is at the root of all our foreign policy and therefore also our domestic policy because whatever we do abroad and whatever money we spend abroad is also you know, related to domestic policy. Mm -hmm. And so why aren't we involved and why is it we find it so difficult to speak? So it was also people looking at it from that perspective. So I have a lot of uh, amazing poets like Roger Reeves and mm -hmm. uh, Ricky Laurentiis and Philip B. Williams talking about Ferguson mm -hmm. and uh, um, Eric Garner and those kinds of issues that we grapple with here and how that is connected also to how we look at what's going on in another place. Well, um, and not to, we go back and we're both writers. Um, I have two anthologies, mm. one that uh, just came out, A Sense of Regard, right. uh, Essays on Poetry and Race um, from University of Georgia Press. And one of the things we were talking about before our interview was the editorial process mm. and the curation that's involved. How do you put these together? How do you get different pieces talking to each other and creating something larger than any of the pieces mm -hmm. alone. And it also teaches you something. So could you talk at all about when you went into doing the anthology, what did you hope? But now that you've, it's in production, so it's done, what did you learn about the subject? What would you want other people to know? Oh, um, I mean, in terms of learning, from a very you know technical point of view, uh, knowing which pieces to put next to each other was uh, uh, it really is an art and not one that I was familiar with, and uh, particularly when you're putting poetry next to fiction or essays uh, and picking up on things that one person is saying and then uh, finding it in somebody else's work, uh, that was really. Uh, learning experience, but also exhilarating in some way, because you realize that a lot of the things that we do as creative people are conversations with each other, and we do pick up on other people's work as we uh, produce our own. And so seeing that happen uh, in the anthology was very uh, good for me. And uh, the other part of it was curating some of the poetry and nonfiction, mm. which I don't, you know, my nonfiction, except for the personal essays, have been all uh, political uh, pieces. And so some of the other nonfiction, like Leslie Jameson's uh, nonfiction, um, or Kazi Mali's, uh, are very different kinds of their real explorations into an issue. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at that uh, critically was also something that I felt was a, a learning experience for me. And of course I had the assistance of, I think the greatest poetry editor on the planet, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly in the United States, Jeff Schatz mm -hmm. from Grey Wolf, who helped me look at some of the poetry and learn how to read it and learn how to uh, really edit it to its best potential. But you must have had some of that same experience with uh, the race issue. Yes, um, definitely. But I'd, I'm not going to have something that you're going to have, which is an opportunity to go to Palestine. Yes. You're doing that around the same time that the anthology is going to come out. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, so I was invited by the Palestinian Festival of Literature, also known as PALFEST, uh, which is uh, a pretty young festival, but it's also one of the most uh, people who go uh, are completely transformed by it. I mean, people like Michael Ondaatje and Teju Cole and, uh, who've been there and have gone on to write about their experience, yeah, Steve Wiley. Um, they, uh, the festival takes place in different parts of Palestine because you know you can't really move from one part of Palestine to other parts of Palestine very easily and its location and its dates depend on what's happening with Israel at any particular time so in a very real sense you are put into the situation that most mm. Palestinians face on a daily basis. Right, so, you were talking about having to have uh, on break you were talking about having to have like a window of time right. in your calendar. Right. 
Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, so they, you know, the dates are set uh, for the festival, but then they ask that you keep a few weeks on either, a week on either side because they never know whether they can do it on that time. And these are things that I think, when we host festivals, we plan a year in advance. I mean, I was just speaking in Seattle at the Search for Meaning Festival at Seattle University, and they were starting the next day to plan the next year's festival. And they can pick a date, and that's right. the date. And it doesn't matter if Seattle wins a game or you know is in the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. they're still going to do it. And you can't do that. And having that issue for a literary festival is one thing, but having that issue every time you wake up in the morning, uh, are you going to school or you're not going to school? Can you go to hospital and have a baby or can you not? Mm -hmm. that, is a, that is the predicament of everybody who lives there every single day. And this, I think, is what you are trying to bring to the world with your anthology. Right. And um, I want to applaud your activism. You are a beautiful creative writer, but you are also a beautiful soul. Thank you for being with us here. You're going to be reading here a little later tonight. I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank it's great you. to be here. This is Rue Freeman. I am Laura McCullough with Brookdale Community College. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.